All right, so a very quick punchline of twin adoption research is this. Heredity explains almost all family resemblance, especially in the long run. Right, that long run point is important. Right, but if you take a look at any trait and try to understand why, you know, why people have that trait, turns out that, the, that upbringing has very little effect on your, on, on your, on your adult traits, where heredity, ha heredity typically has quite strong traits. Right, so just some general patterns that we can see. First of all, identical twins are much more similar than fraternal twins, and this difference often grows with age. This difference often grows with age. So you might think that uh, you know, that, you know, as, that the, the result will shrink with age as you're, ra as you're raised to be more and more alike actually goes the other way. Right? So as you get older and older, the similarity actually tends to get stronger and stronger for a number of traits. Okay? Another finding, adoptees do mildly resemble their adopting families when they're little kids. Right? So if you go and take a look at seven-year-old adoptees and correlate their traits with those of the families that they're being raised with, there you often will see at least some moderate effects of, the, uh, of, the moderate effects of upbringing. And again, we know that this is actually causal because, uh, at least in some experiments, or, some, or you know, some kinds of adoptions, you are assigned randomly to a family. So this is the gold standard of science, where you, randomly send, out to a, you know, randomly send lots of people out to different treatments, and then see how they turn out differently on average. Okay, so, uh, for young kids, uh, adoptees do mildly resemble their adopting families when they're little kids, but most of the similarity vanishes by adulthood. Most of the similarity vanishes by, vanishes by adulthood. So as you get older, you grow more and more apart from your adopting family, and eventually, on average, there is very little, very, little, very, little, very little tendency for you to resemble the people who raised you. On the other hand, if you go and take a look at the people that are your biological relatives that you never met, right, and, some, and this has been done, right? So for example, sometimes when people are put up for adoption, they've given IQ tests to the mom, they're giving an IQ test to the mom at the very same day that she puts the kid up for adoption. And then you go and correlate that kid's IQ when he is 18 to the score that his mom got on the day that he was put up for adoption. And see, wow, there's actually a significant correlation here. Okay. Now, the best way of understanding this is with a little slogan or analogy. So, contrary to popular view, kids are not like clay. Right? Kids are not like clay where you go and get them as a lump, you mold them into whatever shape you want, put them in a kiln, and they stay that way for life. That's not how the real world works. Instead, kids are a lot more like flexible plastic. Right? Flexible plastic does respond to pressure. Yes, and by coincidence, I do have a flexible plastic bottle here. Yes, so it does respond to pressure. Uh oh, it didn't mean, it didn't mean to spill water. But, <laughs> all right. All right, so, so this does respond to pressure, as you can see. Right? I can squeeze it, it, do it does move, but notice what happens when I remove my thumb. It goes back to the way that it would have been otherwise. Right? So, you can, so yes, the environment does matter for the shape of that, for the shape of that plastic bottle, but within a very broad range of squeezing, you can squeeze it, change the shape in all sorts of different ways, but when you remove the pressure, the change goes away. Now, it's true that you could also crush the bottle, in which case uh, the, change would, the change would remain. Right? And you could also say the same for kids. Fortunately, we don't do that experiment very often. Right? Fortunately. Fortunately, we do not do that experiment very often, so when kids are adopted, they are, you know, they are generally raised by family that, you know, they're, the family that wanted kids. They get decent treatment. This is not saying there's no conceivable change, that a fa there's no conceivable thing parents could do to you that would change you. Rather, what it's saying is the kinds of things that parents do, the kinds of things that parents actually do with some frequency, have a very little permanent effect. I know, again, if you were to go and have a kid raised by wolves, it would be a different story. But presumably, none of you are planning on doing that. I mean, it's not a popular parenting style, and uh, for a very, very good thing. All right, so kids are not like clay, the parents mold for life. Rather, they're like flexible plastic that responds to pressure, but pops back to its original shape when the pressure is released. Okay. All right, now. Uh, in my book, I wound up uh, organizing all this research around what I call the parental wish list. Sorry, Steve, is there a time somewhere? I'm not seeing a clock anywhere. You've got 30 okay. minutes. Okay, 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 very good, very good. Okay, so, but, uh, but, but, that, but that's, that's including, but I want to say 15 minutes for questions, so. That's okay, all right, okay, very good. All right, so in the book, I, I try to organize all this twin adoption research around what I call the parental wish list. So, so let's go and make a list of all the things that parents like to encourage. Let's go make a list of all the things that parents like to encourage so that we can, actually, so that we can see whether parents are having an effect when they're trying to have an effect. Right? So it wouldn't be very surprising if you didn't see any effect of parents for something that they weren't trying to change. What you want to do is to come up with a list of things that parents do want to affect and see whether parenting actually matters for those very things. Okay? So, so basically, I decided, well, this will kind of work chronologically. So the very first thing that parents try to affect is their kids' health. 
And so very first thing parents try to affect is their kids' health. This is why you take your prenatal vitamins. This is why you try to eat right. This is why you try to not drink alcohol when you're pregnant, right, so on. So the many things, so you know, it begins this way. And then, of course, once the kid is born, there's all kinds of effort to affect the kid's nutrition, to, affect, to, to make him brush his teeth, to make him exercise, say, I'm not going to let you lie around playing video games on the couch all day. I don't want you to, want, don't want you to grow up and be really fat. You take your kid to the doctor, right? So you, know, you make your kid wear a coat. All kinds of things that parents do to try to affect their kid's health. Now, when you think about it, though, this has some interesting implications. For example, if parents are able to affect their kid's health, then parents should actually matter for how long you live. There should be some effect upon how long, of your parents upon how long you live. Why? You know, for example, so, you know, take the classic thing where parents say, look, you, I'm not going to let you eat junk food all the time. You say, well, I mean, I feel fine. Well, you might feel fine now, but, what, but with those terrible eating habits you've learned, you're going to grow up, you're going to be overweight, you're going to be unhealthy, and then you're going to be paying for it, and I'm not going to allow that. Okay? So if that worked, if you could actually put your kid on the path to good eating habits as a child, then you should be able to affect how long your child lives. And growing up in a home where your parents are, are pushing good food on, upon you should lead to long life, and growing up at home where parents don't put as much effort should lead to shorter life. Okay? So that's one, so that's, that's one trait. Uh, so you know, another thing that parents try to affect, again, this is sometimes even prenatal, intelligence. So anyone know someone who played Mozart for their unborn child in the womb? Yes, uh, all based upon a totally, you know, a, a, this is based upon a misreport of a misreport of a study about the Mozart effect. Uh, yes, so I mean, the, original, you know, the original study was debunked, but the original study was for college students. It wasn't for unborn, unborn children. So you actually had to have a real stretch to think that if Mozart raised the IQ of, co of college students, it could raise the effect of someone encased in a vat of liquid who was, uh, you know, might not even have his ears working at the time. Right, but anyway, uh, so parents do try to affect their children's intelligence by playing Mozart for them, but of course there's many other things they do. There are the educational mobiles and baby Einstein reading your kids, all sorts of things along these lines meant to, meant to increase your child's adult intelligence. Okay. And you're saying, you know, what's the point of this? Well, I want my child to be smart. I want to give him intellectual stimulation so that my child will grow up to be a smart person. Right. There you go. All right, that's another one. Uh, three, happiness. Parents generally want their kids to be happy. Right. Sometimes they'll claim that's the only thing they want, which is probably not true. Uh, but uh, so anyway, one of the things that parents usually want for their kids is for them to be happy. So, uh, there's many things that parents do for you in order to give you happiness. Uh, one of them, of course, is nagging you very hard so that you are successful and then happy, you're happy later on. And you might appear to be miserable while they're nagging you. Uh, but, um, you, because I nag you, then you'll be able to get a good job and then you'll thank me later. Right, you know, stand your thing. You're always going to be thanking your parents sometime in the future. Anyone thanking their, your parents yet for, for this stuff? Yeah. You, you, you just make them feel better anyway. Just give them thanks. Even, if, perhaps even if it's not true. But. All right. So, uh, these are some things. We you know some other things. Of course, uh, there's parents who don't punish their kids on the theory of you if they punish them, they'll feel unloved and they'll grow up to be unhappy. Uh, there are parents who you know, try to tell their kids stories about how hard they had it when they were kids in order to make them feel better about their own lives by comparison. Uh, there are parents who are really nice to their kids all the time, right? so you know, in the hope that this will turn them into happy people. It's a long, long list of things that parents do in order to make their kids happy. Right? Then, of course, we have success. In which, uh, if you're in college, all of you probably have some familiarity with your parents trying to, trying to increase your success. Right? So in the book, I talk about two different kinds of success. I talk about educational success. So you know, the simplest measure here is just how many years of schooling do you complete? How many years of schooling do you actually want to completing? So it seems like parents uh, do a lot of things in order to increase this. So nagging you to do your homework, putting you in tutoring, telling you about how important it is to succeed in school, stuff like this. And the other thing that I look at is adult income. Right, so how much money do you make? Because you know, very often if you actually ask your parents, like, I don't, why do I have to go to school? And, you know, eventually they may say, well, the reason is you have to go to school in order to make a lot of money. So uh, the reason why I'm nagging you about your education is because I'm really nagging you to be rich. I want you to be financially successful. Okay? And of course then you'll be happy, right? Maybe. All right, so something else that parents definitely try to influence. Uh, then I talk about character. Now by character what I mean is Traits that, almost, you know, traits that almost everyone considers morally good, right? So something like honesty, kindness. It's really, you know, very, very, very rarely do you meet someone who is, who is against honesty and thinks that all children, children should be taught to lie, or someone who is someone who's against kindness. Right? So these are widely believed in by people of almost every view. Right? So, uh, these, you know, so, so that, 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 this is what I mean by character, and, and this I distinguish from values. Values are you know, moral traits that are controversial. 
So this could be things like trying to raise you to be religious in a, certain, in a particular religion, right? Or trying to raise you to think that the death penalty is right or wrong, right? Or it could be politics. So you know, it could be raising you to be a Democrat or raising you to believe in, raising you to believe in socialized medicine. Uh, it could be things like you know, raising you to believe that marriage is important, right? It could be whether or not your, your parents convince you to, or are able to convince you uh, to stay married if you do get married, right? It could be nagging about how many kids you have. Right? Something else, you know, some people think that you should have a lot of kids, other people think you should have two. Some people will tell you to have none at all, tell you that, you should make, that, you, that the right thing to do for the planet is to have zero children. Right? Something else you may be taught. Right? Right? So, and then a final one, that it seems that parents uh, make a big deal about, is appreciation. Right? So parents like you to, uh, to appreciate what they've done for you. So they like, your parents want you to like them, they want you to look favorably upon all the sacrifices they made for you, and they'd also probably like you to remember them fondly after they're gone. All right, so again, this is not, obviously this is not every possible trait that people could care about, but I think it is a pretty good summary of the main things that parents are trying to cause their kids to have. All right, now what happens if we go to the data? So we go and we take a look at twin adoption studies, and again, so there are twin adoption studies for every single one of these traits. And not just like one crummy study with five twins, lots of good studies with thousands. Lots of good studies, with, that, you know, with 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, even 10,000 subjects in them. Okay, a lot of the best ones come from Scandinavia where they've been keeping extremely accurate records on people for the last 150 years. Okay, but there's many other good ones as well. So there's, you know, there's a Minnesota twin study. There's something called the Virginia 30,000 study where they've been keep, keeping track of uh, twins in Virginia. Right? Uh, there's also some very good twin databases for Australia. Right? So, Again, you know, so the, I mean, area, areas that are covered less are, you know, like, you know, third world and also Asian countries. There's not very much for them. So that's, and, you know, but again, plenty, plenty for the United States, uh, Canada, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, right, uh, Australia, like I said. So these are all different places where we can get the data and we can go and see what we get. Okay. So what do we find? Well, just go down the list. Uh, parents have little or no long run effect on their kids' health. This is true for life expectancy. And here we can actually go to data from Denmark where they actually been keeping data on twins from 1870. So basically, you know, they, they, you know, so there's like one study, it goes from like 1870 about 1900. So essentially everyone who was born between 1870 and 1900 is now dead. What we can do then is take a look at the identical twins and look at the correlation between their life expectancy, you know, how long they lived, compare this to the correlation for fraternal twins. And from this, there we, there's a little math that we can do. And from this, we can get an estimate of what the effect of nature and nurture were. Uh, there, you know, so you might say, well, life expectancy isn't the only measure of health. There's others. Yes, there are others, and they've been done, right? So there are measures of health based upon, a, based upon a doctor's examination of you at different ages. Measures of health based upon your complaints, based upon what you say about how good your health is, right? So you go through all this work, and you have very strong results, a little or, little or no long-run effect on kids' health, right? There are a few sporadic effects for, you know, in some exceptional cases, but the bulk of the research just finds nothing. Right? So the home that you grew up in does not wind up making a difference for how long you live and does not make a difference for how healthy you say that you are when you're 50 or 60 or 70 either. Right. All right, so that's one. Uh, intelligence is another. Right? So this one has been studied very extensively uh, despite the controversy surrounding intelligence. And I don't have time here to defend the study of intelligence other than to say that there's a lot of work done on it. And what is, what is, what is known by people who actually know the numbers is very different from what you may have heard, uh, heard, heard a critical about the tests. Among people who actually know the data, there's very little question about how useful, it measure, how useful IQ tests are. How useful? Well, better than anything else we've got. You may say that's not perfect. No, it's not perfect. But still, number one is pretty good. Right, number one is pretty good. So a lot of work has been done on heritability of intelligence. So here there's a particularly remarkable study of twins in Colorado. Or no, excuse me, a study of adoptees in Colorado where what they did is they got something like, like 250 adoptees and they measured the IQs of the moms who gave them up for adoption. They measured the IQs of the adopting parents. And then they measured the IQs of the kids when they were like, 2, 4, 6, like 7, 10, 12, 16. They also, they also tested the biological children of the families, if any. And they also set up a control group of 200, 250 other kids and other families. All right, so basically they were, they were haunting these families for about 20 years pestering them, right? So you get adopted, and yes, obviously when you're, when you're a baby and you're adopted, they don't test your IQ then, but they can start giving you very simple IQ tests a couple years later, and they can start giving you real IQ tests once, 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 once you're about six. All right, so what was found there 
is that when they looked at the, uh, when they, when they looked at the effect of parents on, on, on the adoptee's intelligence, at seven, there actually was a noticeable effect. So when you're seven years old, if you were raised by a higher IQ family, your IQ was noticeably higher. However, by the time you were 12, this disappeared. And they tested again at 16, it had not reappeared, it was still gone. Right? And the story here is pretty simple, it basically is, look, when you're very young, your parents have a lot of control over your environment. So if you grow up in a high IQ family where they're reading books all the time and they don't have a television, they actually can push you and control your environment enough to make you get better at the kinds of things that are tested in an IQ test. But what happens as you get older? Well, as, the, as you get older, your parents have less and less control over what your environment is like. And eventually, when you get to 12, you are able to find your own level. Right? And, if you're, and if the people who adopted you are not interested in books, but you, na but you have a natural inclination for this, you start doing it, and your IQ starts catching up to where it would have been otherwise if you were raised by your biological relatives. And by the time you're 16, uh, pretty much uh, you were on your own. Right? Your, parents, your adopting parents can still nag you, but it doesn't seem to have any effect. Okay, uh, happiness. So happiness, there's been some very good twin research on this. And this is particularly interesting because this is actually the classic study where you, they not only compare identical fraternal twins, but they compare twins who were separated at birth. So you have identical twins separated at birth, fraternal twins separated at birth, identical twins raised together, fraternal twins raised together. And if you go into the, you know, you know I'm not going to go into the mathematics, but this is the very best test that you can get. And the punchline of this is very simple. Identical twins raised apart were actually a little bit more similar in their adult happiness than the identical twins raised together. So, a maximum effect of environment of zero. Possibly there's actually a negative effect, which uh, would be a little bit odd. Right? But you know, the best story you could tell there is that when twins are raced together, they may actually wind up rebelling. One of them does one thing and the other does the opposite in order to, create, in order to uh, assert his individuality. Whereas if you grow up apart, you can't assert your individuality because you don't, don't know what your individuality is different from. Okay, so, so my, twi yeah, my twins, uh, I know you know, one of them seems to be more obedient than the other. And it really does seem like the one who is more obedient started doing it because his brother wasn't. Sort of saying, hey, I'm not like him. You know, don't punish me with him. He may be my identical twin, but uh, you know, I've got nothing to do with him. Okay, so you got that for happiness. Uh, success as well. So for success, there's been some very excellent adoption work on educational attainment. Here what you find is a very small effect. So there was a study of, of, uh, of Korean war orphans who were adopted by American families after the Korean War. Then they took a look at the education levels of the adoptees when they were adults and compared it to their parents. Basically, they found a very small effect. So essentially, if the mom who adopted you had one more year of education, you, on average, completed about five more weeks of education. In other words, in order to increase the, uh, the educational attainment of an adoptee by one year, just one more year, the mom would need about 10 more years of education. Okay, so that's a lot. You'd also never see your mom if she were trying to raise her education in this manner. Right? Uh, so, you know, now for income, uh, here there's, there's been some very good work on Swedish adoptee, or uh, Swedish twins rather, so Swedish twins. Well, now in Sweden you have no financial privacy whatsoever, so researchers can find out your income if they want. It's not like the United States where this is considered private. So they can find out your income, for out your, and, and this is recorded throughout your entire life. So, they can base, so someone, uh, researchers can go to Sweden and get all of your old tax returns. So find out all of your income. Also, Sweden has conscription, so every Swede has his, uh, you know, so every, every, every Swede has his IQ tested, every Swede has a, has a personality evaluation done by, psycho done by a psychologist, right? So, uh, the punchline out of this is for income, when you're young, there is an effect to your parents. So basically, when you are between the ages of 18 and 25, you can see a parental effect on income. However, by the time you're older, it goes away. So, for people who are older, you see no effect of parents on income, so basically it looks like your parents can exert some nepotism to get you your first job. So some parents can go and get you a good job that, you know, where you're paid a bit more than you're worth. However, nepotism only goes so far. Right? And eventually, by the time you're in your late 20s, you have to stand on your own two feet, and mommy and daddy don't help you anymore, and then you get paid what you're worth. Okay. Right? And then finally, character. So here, there's some uh, per personality tests uh, that I'm not going to go into, but which give us some pretty good measures of the, of the non-controversial character traits. Right? And, so, so, uh, and again, getting a very similar result of very little effect of parents upon, bo upon both your, both your you know, how nice of a person you are and upon how hardworking and disciplined of a person you are. Right? So like I said, so even family resemblance in income sends almost entirely from heredity right, in the longer run. Again, this doesn't mean that, say, Bill Gates won't be able to affect it. Bill Gates is not a one in a thousand person. He's like a one in a billion. One, one in, he's like a one in six billion person, so uh, very rare. All right. Now, we do see that parents have a strong long-run effect on superficial values, like the religion and political party the kids say they identify with. However, they have very little on behavior or convictions. So can parents change the religion that you say you belong to as an adult? Yes. 
So if you're raised as a Presbyterian, you will probably say that you were Presbyterian for the rest of your life. However, there's also studies of things like, do you actually go to church? And are parents able to influence that? And there the result is by the time you're in your 30s, very little effect of parents on church, on church attendance. And there's also questions about religious doctrine, things like that. And the same thing goes for politics. Parents have a very substantial effect upon the political party you say that you belong to, but much smaller effect upon whether you actually vote, much smaller effect upon whether you vote the party line, much smaller effect upon what particular issue views you have. Right? Now, the most meaningful of all the effects that parents have is parents do have a moderate long-run effect on number seven, appreciation. So how their children perceive and remember them. How their children perceive and remember them. Okay. Now, here's some caveats. So, first of all, what researchers find, depend uh, researchers find depends on where they look. Okay, so, uh, twin adoption studies rarely include kids raised by wolves or abandoned in Haiti. So, none of this is saying that you can safely go and abandon your kid in Haiti and it'll turn out fine. Right? Uh, you, know, you may starve to death. It could be, it could be terrible. Similarly, none of this is saying you, know, you can lock your kid in a closet and learn to speak perfect English all by himself in the dark. Also false. Okay, rather, what this is, you know, so nurture probably matters a lot in these cases. Now, I will say that these experiments are almost never done. Right, fortunately, these experiments are never done. They'd be terrible. But, uh, so, but keep that in mind. All right, so here's a very good rule of thumb. Would an adoption agency consider you fit to adopt? If so, you're good enough. Would an adoption agency say, you know, say that you are a fit parent? In that case, what you're doing is fine. Right? If, they, if they go to your house and say this person's unfit, then maybe there is an issue. Right? But you know, the people who are in these studies generally are above a very, a very basic line. Right? So, you know, of course, if you are horribly abusive, you probably aren't going and participating in twin surveys. 